Hello everyone. Welcome to another IEEE SBM interview. We will be interviewing members of our organization from the electronics department in order to get an insight on their journeys as well as advice for ourselves. Introducing our guest first. First off, we have Preeta Saha from the ECE department. She has served as the vice chairperson of Women in Engineering, which is an affinity group of IEEE student branch Manipal and is currently placed at Wells Fargo. Next, we have Abhiru Mukherjee. He is a fourth year Tripoli student at MIT Manipal. He has grabbed an internship at IBM. He is also the ex electronics head at IEEE SBM. And lastly, with immense pleasure, I would like to introduce Samik Gandhi, the ex chairperson of the IEEE SBM family, who is currently at TCS Digital. And once again, I would like to extend a heartfelt thanks to all my guests here. Okay, folks, so let's begin what will be uh, hopefully a very good 45 minutes for you. So uh, first off, I would like to ask all three of you uh, to give your insights on what are the major or minor differences between the three electronics branches. Uh, we'll start with you, Preeta. Uh, yes, uh, so I'll just focus on EC right now. I think that uh, there is not as such major differences between the three branches because all of them in like the basics remain in electronics and electrical. But then I think EC kind of focuses a little bit more on the communication aspect and the networking aspect, uh, while the other branches have their own, uh, you know, specializations. So um, Abhiru, would you like to take it from here for Triple E? Yeah, so as Preeta said, electronics is the part that all three branches have in common and the other part is where each have each move into their own specialization. So as EC is more about communications, Triple E uh, also works on the generation of generation, distribution, transmission, all of those aspects, as well as more about high voltage circuitry. So I guess Samit can elaborate on what ENI is special speciality is. Uh, I guess uh, you both covered it up pretty nicely. Like till fourth uh, semester, I guess most of the things are same. Like it's all just an electronics based integra uh, integrated circuit and everything. After that, you have a bit of detail in process control and control theory and automation subjects like microcontrollers and everything. Those get oriented towards the different domains. Like for Tripoli, I would assume that they are controlling, like as the group said, high voltage circuitry. For us, maybe we are controlling the power plant or process control or something like that. So there's a minor difference in the subject, not a major one. Okay. Moving on, uh, the next question is. How can one manage the workload in electrical branches considering it is said to have the most hectic schedule and also it has led to the longest running joke that it is a five year course rather than a four year one. So Abhiru, would you like to go first? Yeah, so as for how to manage the workload, honestly, if one of you finds out, please tell me as well because I still struggle to do it. But if I had to give one tip, uh, it would probably be that uh, at least once a week, just try to. I know how like a cliche that sounds, but just once a, on the weekends, at least give one hour just to revise what you have. Because as you, if you try to do it as I did, as in you're studying a month before the exam, uh, electronics as a branch is that uh, every topic builds on another thing. So if you don't understand the first topic, you can't just skip to the last thing just because uh, it has more weightage in the exam or something. You have to do it start to finish. Otherwise, none of them get covered. So that is the problem. So if you just chip away at it, uh, it it's still a lot, but uh, it becomes more manageable that way. OK, thank you. Samik, do you have any extra tips for us? Uh, yeah, kind of as an additional tip. Uh, I personally did not do weekly thing. What I used to focus on during the offline classes was that uh, I used to just note down and understand what the teacher was saying and like in 80 percent of the classes not 100 percent and in my room in the study hall i did not study at all before the last week of the exam and because i had understood everything it was manageable for me but for my peers who were not studying in class even if they were studying by themselves at home or whatever they were not understanding the concept as deeply and then they had to give more time to it because they were trying to understand it by themselves. Like the teachers do give a easier version of the subject to us. 
Thank you, Samik. Mm-hmm. Preeta, do we have more tips? Because we really need some tips. Uh, yeah, like um, I also did not follow the weekly thing, but it's a very nice idea. And I think that Samik and Abhiru covered most of it. But then I think uh, planning also plays a very important role. Like if you plan out your subjects properly and a lot uh, some time to each of it and depending that that again depends on individuals because you someone may find a subject difficult. Others may find that very interesting. So that depends on your capability to grasp the subjects. So I guess you have to plan out the subjects properly, devote time, but yeah, don't uh, slack away because if you do that, then it just keeps piling up and then coping up with it is very difficult. So you need to do that. And I guess uh, practicing problems is very important. Like uh, does not matter if you solve like 100 questions, but you have to solve the important concepts questions. I think that plays a major role. So if you do that, I think you can manage the hectic schedule. These are a few tips from my end. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, uh, moving on from what Anushree said, I would like to just extend that question and ask you all that uh, for you all, which semester seemed like the most easiest out of the lot and which semester was like the most difficult? Also, like where there's some particular subjects that you all found difficult and if so, like how did you all tackle them? Maybe Samik, you could go first here. Uh, I feel that there is not as such particularly difficult semesters. Rather, than, rather there are difficult subjects in particular semesters. Like modern control theory and instrumentation is a pretty difficult subject for most people. So, like yeah, for me that was the most difficult subject in all of my seven semesters till now. And uh, there, there are some subjects, but they are spread out among the semesters. So it's not that there is a difficult semester. Also. In my opinion, in my experience. Abhirup and Prita, do you all have any insights on that? Yeah, I would say for Tripoli, the trend is generally like the third semester is where most people find the most difficulty. Mostly because after doing a year of, uh, I, w- I don't want to say random subjects, but, ba- but basically random subjects, you jump back into the whole physics and the electronics part after you have already been given a year of gap between your 12th where you actually learned all the stuff and now you have to do the same things again. So because people don't revise it in that one year, it becomes really difficult to, you know, learn it again. Other than that, the subject that I found most difficult was because I didn't find didn't have any interest in it was uh, general transmission and distribution. So because me personally, I lean more towards the embedded circuitry, those sort of things. So because that subject was so far out of my interest, I, d- I didn't basically I didn't give the attention to it that it needed. So that's why it became difficult for me. Other than that, I would say in Tripoli, any subject that you find interesting becomes easier. Anything you don't find interesting becomes difficult. Well, Prita, would you like to conclude? Anything? Uh, yeah, this I think the similar trend goes for EC also. It depends on you which subject you find interesting. So you tend to understand it better and then that becomes easier. So it merely comes down to how much you can understand and how much you can grasp. For me personally, I feel that uh, the easiest semester was SEM4 <laughs> because uh, I really enjoyed a DSP and I also liked um, I, li- I liked all the subjects in SEM4 actually. So like I had VLSI, I, I really wanted to learn about those and I spent more time compa- like relatively and uh, I felt that SEM4 is easily, I could cope up with it and I faced difficulty in SEM3 actually because of that transition from first year to second year and even SEM5 was slightly difficult in my opinion because the antenna aspect and everything come into EC which is a lot to take in so. That will be from my end. Uh, I would like to add one little thing. Yeah, Seventh yeah, sure. semester can be one of the easiest semesters for you, considering all the three years, for second, third, third, sorry, all the four years. Because if you have a good choice of subjects which you are interested in, as Abhirup and Pita said, it becomes really easy if you are genuinely interested in the subjects you, uh, you choose for your elective. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I would like to ask all three of you uh, what you would recommend as OEs and PEs to us. Okay. 
well for the oe i guess i i would i think or any subject and uh, like any branch student would tell you the same thing just take whatever the humanities oe you are available because oe first of all none of it will be related to any of your coursework so it's just a time sink so might as well take something that's easy to study or at least enjoyable to study uh if not try to take whatever can be even uh, tangentially related to your coursework at least that will be helpful at least uh other, for the pe's that's again it will depend on your interest like me personally i lean towards the embedded stuff so obviously i took embedded as the minor uh, some of my friends were more into a bit more into the hardware so they took vlsi and stuff so it just depends on what you're interested in uh in my opinion as well like for oe you should do something either that is very easy so that you don't have to pay any heed to it just study on the last day of the exam otherwise you can experiment a bit with oe because it is not as difficult to just pass a subject even if you don't find it really good so if you want to learn something new and you're not sure whether you'll like it or not you can try to opt uh, for it as an oe and for pe like abhirup said go for something that you're interested in because it makes the seven subjects really easy four for the minor and three for, uh, from your branch so seven subjects is a big deal it becomes really easy to study if you like want to study those subjects um i feel that um oe whatever you take like there are technical there are some technical oes and there then there are some non technical which belongs in humanities and iie so uh, some people tend to go for technical oes because uh, technical oes may cover a lot in theory and if that works out for you well then good enough then you are sorted there but if you want uncomfortable with that then i would suggest that yes go for an easier one which you will enjoy because the whole point of oe is it's not calculated in your cg it's something uh, it's some area that you can experiment with when you want to discover what a field actually interests you in so that aage ja ke you can choose that branch or you can research more about that area and hence you can make uh, further career decisions so that's the whole point of oe like you get to delve into uh, an overview of a field and you get to see what is there and then you can decide for yourself if you don't like it then well enough you just need to do the bare in a bare minimum to just pass the oe but other than that if you really find that interesting then you'll get a heads up real soon which will work good enough for you like although the faculty may not really uh, be that invested in the oe you can do a lot of background work in that area and then you can uh, make wiser decisions so that will be from my end Uh, I'll be I'll be sure to use this advice while choosing my PE. Oh, it's a thing of past, unfortunately for us. Uh, thank you so much. For Next off, I'll ask you. I'll direct this question to all three of you. Based on your experiences, how important or relevant is it for electrical students to know or learn competitive coding? Uh, I would suggest that everyone should dabble into this, not just electronic subjects, even mechanical departments, chemical, civil, all the departments should at least dabble with competitive coding because it gives you a very good general idea of the DSA foundation. Like uh, DSA is required everywhere these days. If not in the job itself, at least for the recruitment processes for all the companies and. even if not that wherever you land in your uh, career or whatever even if it's in research or something even if you're researching or building something new you'll have to use a bit of code or uh, the coding like you'll have to have a coding background for whatever you do these days because it's everywhere well abhirup and prita would you like to add on to that uh i would say i'm not probably the right person to ask this question because i personally did not devote any time to competitive coding per se mostly because i had learnt uh, coding and basics of dsa in my 12th so i just use that knowledge to you know co- you know do whatever coding related stuff was required through these four years what would i the only place where i felt the application for coding for me personally was because 
in electronics a lot of the design and stuff you also have to code it because that is also part of your role so in that and in there you will also have subjects like embedded system design or microcontrollers these uh, i think microcontrollers is a common subject for all triple e students mpn so, yeah so you will have to know how to code then so if you all but the thing is in electronics the coding is very simplistic so if you know uh the basics of coding those subjects become a breeze so it you'll won't even take 30 minutes to you know complete an entire lab assignment because you already know what how coding is you you can't learn coding and the subject at the same time that becomes really overwhelming uh yeah to add to add on to that i think um like it's not mandatory that everyone have has to be invested in coding because people might not like coding and then it becomes really difficult for them to handle because like uh, like as much as i want to disagree but the trend is that all companies look for like coding background a lot it's like a mad race everyone comes and they just want to test out your dsa they just want to test out how well you code they ask you to code and everything but uh, it all comes down to uh, the fact that they want to know what you're thinking your line of thought and dsa is the best way in my opinion to test that out because there are different algorithms there are different data structures and how well you implement that just shows that how well you can implement a problem break them down into smaller problems and actually tackle it in your real life so that is the uh, real reason why people focus on dsa and uh, competitive coding is like so important basically but people might not uh, you know be interested so for them basics of programming is enough they need to do the basics at least because then uh, they can uh, say in simple terms what they feel and they can implement uh, if they are asked to so yeah i mean with all the talk about dsa i think kushagar is really happy with the oe is taken so <laughs> Uh, well, uh, moving on from Anushree's question, so adhering uh, to a similar question as to, uh, could your advisors as to how electronic students could like take time off from their academic schedule, considering that triple E, E, C, and E I have like hectic schedule. So, what are the ways in which we can take time off to like practice other important skills, which could like further help us in our career? Mm -hmm. I think Samik, you can go first. Uh, I feel that. Especially if you're not uh, really interested in coding, as Pita said, you can start in the sixth semester break that you get the break before sixth semester. That gives you plenty of time to like get uh, accustomed to a lot of the things that are required by the different uh, company procedures, recruitment procedures. Like there are coding rounds which include basic data structures and basic algorithms, BD algorithms, and if you're not looking for a core software development engineering role, you don't have to go as much in depth anyways. So any, just pick one of the platforms like uh, there's Hackerang, there's Lead Code and Codechef. There's a lot of uh, platforms as such. So just pick anyone and get started. It's not that difficult once you get started. It seems daunting at first, but once you get started, it's really easy. Abhirup, anything to add on? Uh, I would I would suggest a similar thing as well. Uh, maybe like uh, uh, approach that I used was instead of thinking of any uh, I'm anything I'm that I'm learning that's not strictly course material. I try to keep it as a derivative of the course material. So like in the semester where I was learning microcontrollers, I started a project that was based around those. So even though I was not technically studying my subject. I was still uh, gaining benefit from doing the extra thing the, that uh, counted towards the subject work itself. So I would say uh, every semester, maybe pick one or two subjects that you like, start a project or do something related to that so that both you are, uh, you know, doing two things at once essentially. Uh, in my opinion, I, I think I have practiced coding almost like every day I used to take time out and most of the days at least I used to take time out and in normal days that used to be fine because once I came this is an offline mode card thing 
so i used to come back from my class and then uh, thoda bahut whatever um, they had taught in class i used to see and most of it i used to listen in the class so that did not take a lot of time so once i've covered all those i used to take some time out and uh, simply focus on coding and it does not matter how honestly it does not matter how many questions i solved whether i solved 5 or 10 questions but the quality of the questions did matter like if i cover some i can proudly say that i have covered this important concept today so uh, people won't ask me how many questions you solved if you understand the concept then if even if it's a different question you can apply your brain to it and you can find it out because you actually know the concept so uh, if you do that on a regular basis then it should not be a big deal because you can take like one week to cover one important concept and then you'll be fine with it you can't really forget it after that so just break it down into a longer period of time and with your hectic schedule you can uh, manage coding too thank you so much okay folks uh, moving forward we'll be asking questions related to internships and placements oh the horror anyhow um i would like to ask what are the internships and job opportunities present within the electronics department and is there any particular suggestions that you guys have for a job or an internship i would like to begin with you preeta uh yeah i think uh, when companies come for internships uh, not just for play job just before placements but for internships which was in after second year i guess so um, that was a time when people started getting serious about um, this placement and internship this horror whatever you said so uh, so what happened is uh, at first it felt like uh, okay only cs people are getting uh, recruited or just the basically the a uh, computer branches people and there were no opportunities left for us because uh, i think hand picked number of students got internships in that manner and that became really scary for us because then we were scared ki placements how how will we get through placements if we couldn't secure an internship and uh, too many companies came for internships too but then uh, if you start off with your coding uh, pretty much early uh, I don't think that cracking these OTs is going to be a big deal for you. Yes, they prefer most of the companies prefer computer branches because their profile matches uh, what these people study in their regular curriculum. But all you need to do is a little practice. So over there you'll have opportunities. Like uh, from my end, I uh, got through Samsung Prism uh, in during that time only. and hence i secured an internship in samsung prism i uh, did a project which was not related to coding coding was just to get through to uh, into the program so that is how i secured an internship other than that you have multiple platforms even if you don't get through into any of the companies that come for internships in on campus you can apply here and there and you'll find multiple multiple opportunities like a startup is a really good place to start because that time you won't have any prior experience and a startup offers huge support like they want people and they teach people a lot so once you are in a startup that will give you a lot of exposure yeah you might not be earning or you might not have all those plus sides but you'll have a huge plus because you will have experience you will get hands on training and you will get a lot of exposure so that's it from my end uh, okay i'd also like to get insight from our other guests on this uh yeah so as pritha said the difficulty with being in electronics is that most uh, companies that come for uh, recruitment in uh, So directly after bachelors are based around software roles, mostly because electronics and electrical as an industry has a higher barrier of entry when it comes to experience. So yeah, so if you are good aiming for a software role, that what Preeta's Preeta's advice is spot on is that you have, if you have you know your uh, coding basics sorted and your DSS sorted, then those aren't really a problem. Uh, I would probably talk about uh, if. if you were to explore opportunities in the electronics domain itself so while colleges won't have that many companies that come for that sort of roles you can that but that is not the only avenue you can explore there are things like research internships 
not only through the college but externally as well and your yeah, startups as well so these are the sort of companies that will take up fresh freshers in that domain because uh, they need a lot more workforce than they need the experience so yeah so me personally i worked with uh, i did a internship in vlsi design with maven silicon which is a decently sized but indian based company so yeah you can't expect to uh, land a internship with nvidia or something uh, right off the bat but yeah you can look for more uh, you know uh, what is it called indian your uh, uh, my bad indian based companies and stuff so they are more willing to take up uh, electronics freshers other than that yeah you can look for uh, research internships in indian universities as well as in uh, other universities in other countries uh, adding on to what avirup said i completely agree with uh, both the opinions peter's opinion and avirup's opinion like adding on to these uh, if you have a good network of people you know in different uh, domains who are actually in the field working in the field that uh, becomes that becomes a like plus point for you to access internships like i interned at emiron technologies it's a, it was a small company back when i was an intern there now they're fast growing they are uh, working in the electronic vehicle sector and like they are changing the it, IT scenario iot scenario in electronic vehicles so back at that time as a group said they were a small company and a startup so they could invest more time in me and i could learn a lot from them while giving my own inputs to them so yeah adding on to peter's and avirup's opinion just have a good network even if you don't land uh, internship from other resources like research internship maybe linkedin maybe campus placement maybe your network can help you out Thank you so much. Moving on, I'll direct this question to Abiru. According to you, if not placements, then which masters or higher studies are a great option after B.Tech in electrical branches? Okay, so yeah, yeah, this is a question, but more comfortable to me because that's what I am going for. Uh, but yeah, essentially, the degrees that you will find are usually masters in electrical. That is the most common degree you will find across most countries. there are some and then uh, under that degree you will probably have the option of a specialization in some stream so uh, they'll have four to five course tracks that are that will be focused on maybe analog circuit design embedded systems maybe computer uh, architecture stuff like that so all of that comes under their uh, school of computer science and electrical engineering that is how they club it together in most countries other than that there will be some universities that provide you more specialized degrees uh, like uh, masters in embedded systems i'm just uh, talking about embedded system because that's what i have explored personally also uh, yeah so you will also have the option of either going for the research research route uh, in which you will have to write a master thesis but uh, some universities universities will also provide you a pr- option for a professional masters the so professional masters will be more akin to you will be learning uh, about the industry hands on so yeah that is something you will have to decide for yourself what sort of flavor do you want to your, for your higher studies samik and pita if you have anything else uh, to add to it uh as for technical courses after bachelor's in electrical department i can't say a lot because i've not explored those options but if you want to go into management side i would say work for at least one or two years from what i've heard from uh, my seniors work for a couple of years figure out what you want to do and then dive into it and added benefit for this is that uh, you get a higher uh, preference in those management schools business schools like they prefer you over other candidates who have no experience because you have a corporate knowledge okay thank you guys I think yeah. uh, the Avirup and Samik covered most of it. I did not really delve into this because I wanted to have some job experience, and then I will figure out what to do, and then I will uh, go into the field which suits me better. Oh uh, yes, you guys. A- a- yeah. adding on to Pita's uh, response to the question, uh, a lot of the times it 
feels like uh, if you don't have a plan for the next five years, you are not doing it right. But sometimes it's okay to take a couple of extra years just to figure out what you want to do. That helps a lot. Well, uh, yeah, that was quite insightful. So, yeah, um, as we know and we have heard about the 44 LPA from Manipal. So I would like to ask you all as to how easy or how difficult it is to like land a top software job from a student in the electronics branch and considering he's from MIT. So any one of you all could like just delve into this. Uh, do you mind if I go into this guy? Anyone, anyone. Uh, so I have zero I, experience with this, so <laughs> I prefer you say. I feel that it's not mm -hmm. impossible to get one of the top packages, let's say 20 plus, let's just take this uh, number, 20 plus LPA. It's not impossible for an electrical or electronic student to get 20 plus LPA package in software, but it's really difficult. Like, first of those companies which are offering that kind of money or compensation, they do not prefer ele electronic students because CSIT and CC students have a better base for what uh, the company requires from them. Like, if you can't work in that company, why will they pay you? So they just don't prefer yeah. electronic students. Electronic students, and uh, even when they are uh, recruiting from all branches, EC. Triple E and EIE students have a back foot at this because a lot of the concepts we are just learning from these websites, uh, HackerRank and, and others, uh, like I mentioned, those don't teach you everything you there is to know about uh, DSA and applications of basic coding and everything. So, yeah, you always have a back foot, but it's not difficult to get a good job in software. But top ones, I feel it's a bit difficult for us. Well, we'll definitely mm -hmm. keep this in mind while we're applying for our jobs and we'll we'll keep this in the back of our heads. Well, yeah, Kushagri, you can continue. Yeah, sure. OK, folks, so I would like to ask you guys what, in your opinion, is a must have for a CV for a student in the electronics branches? Um, uh, how about you take this? Yeah, yeah I'll, uh, I'll go first. So uh, I don't think there is as such a must have and I can't mandate for all the departments over here, but I think that whatever field you are interested in, a project in that field really helps. Or if you have a paper published, then that gives a lot of weightage. And if you have experience in that field, I think that's enough for you to get through an interview because what the interviewer is looking for is whatever you have listed in your CV, you are 100% confident in it because they are going to grill you on that. Like anything, any single word that you mention in your CV, you should be able to talk about it. You should have 100% knowledge of it if you state that you have done it. So there is no rule that you have to do a project. You can do something else also. You can do an internship in your field, but just know what you're doing. You can't just uh, state something in your CV just for the sake of the length of it. You don't want to make an elaborate CV just to show that you have a lot of experience. That is not what a recruiter is looking for. A recruiter is looking for your uh, dedication and uh, your honesty, or he wants to know that you are hardworking and whatever you have stated, you have a basic knowledge of it. You know what you did and you will be willing to learn more. So that is what you have to show them that you are willing to learn more, you are willing to contribute and whatever you have done, you are proud of it. Mm -hmm. So I think project, paper, experience, anything carries this equal weightage, but then you should be confident about it. Adding on to Pita's uh, opinion, I, I completely agree with her opinion. Uh, a proof of your skill is very important. Like if you have no projects, no research papers, no let's say white papers, no interaction with any of the skills as a demonstration of what you've learned, it becomes very difficult. So dive into projects, talk to teachers what they're researching on, they'll onboard you for projects. Teachers in MIT really do appreciate uh, students approaching them for these things, in my experience. Uh, along with that, I would say that more important than writing what you've done in your CV, it's more important to write how that affected what you've done. 
like let's say i made a project which does abc i don't want to say that i did abc because 10000 other people will write the same thing that they've done abc i want to write that x percent improvement in performance in the process of abc that will be more uh, attractive to a recruiter because that's something that stands out like everyone does abc but did they do anything different that made it better that is a uh, important thing yeah i would say preeta and samit covered a lot of uh, what your resume might require from in terms of you know getting placed or getting an internship i'll just touch upon if you want if what your resume might require if you want to go for higher studies for higher studies one thing that really you know boosts your resume is a, any sort of publication related to the course you will be pursuing for, like honestly from the profiles that i have explored i have seen the trend that uh people with like a, even a 6.5 to a 7 cgpa uh, get a seat in the university over someone with a 9 plus cgpa just because they had a publication that was relevant because as soon as you leave your bachelor's and try to pursue a masters it becomes very less about how well you did in your academics and more about how interested you were in what you were learning so that is any publication any sort of project it is a demonstration of that so yeah that is one thing it's okay obviously not a must have but yeah i would say if you can have it then it's a big plus okay thank you so much so following through the last question what were the some of the projects or research papers that you guys worked on and how was the whole experience any of you could go first yeah a little bit of insight a group you want to tell them about the project you did in ITP okay yeah so oh, we would under, love to hear about it okay yeah so under ITP i along with some of the mancom members then uh i think varun i don't remember if varun was part of it but yeah we basically designed a microcontroller development board from scratch so the basically the motivation behind doing that project was i wanted to show the mancop members and also learn myself how to practically apply their subjects that they are learning because this was around a year ago when uh, they were learning microcontrollers and i was learning embedded system design so it was uh, i think at that point we decided to design it because both of us both of the parties could learn from that so essentially we implemented one sensor on it one microcontroller and stuff like that and then it took a few weeks but basically we explored not only the actual uh, circuit design decisions like what has to the practical thought that has to go into that but also they learned about as a product how do you design it because then because we were the ones funding it so we also had to think about the pricing and component selection based on that pricing so it was i think uh, the benefit of that project was not only did it give us subject based knowledge it also gives gave us an uh, insight into the industry thank you abiru samek or preeta we have anything to add uh mm-hmm. yeah like you can do a lot of projects it's not that difficult once you get started with doing anything uh yeah in my term in i trip believe when i was in mancom i guess so uh, i did one project which was uh, facial expression detection in real time so the motivation behind that was very simple uh, we had a club expo which was offline so every club could have a stall a uh, club organization student project everything we could have a stall all the freshers could could come in and just look at the project and see what's interesting in, about uh, different uh, organizations so yeah i like our seniors told us ki we need something to display there and i was like okay i'll try something simple thing you can have a laptop there will the camera will be on whoever walks in front of the camera will see your face and like just give a banner like you're happy you're laughing you're sad what are you like are you depressed aisa kuch it's really simple with a basic computer vision open cv and with python like at first it seemed very daunting i thought i'll just uh, was simple face capture like whoever is walking in front it will draw a border around their face 
but once i started learning open theory i could build this project simply like in three or four weeks i guess it was not that difficult and uh, there have been other projects throughout the years as well like we've delved, delved into arduino projects a lot and a group and i kind of hate it now because of the saturation of arduino projects uh, yeah there's a lot of projects to do. um so uh, i did two projects so but uh, one was uh, for i think um cn lab i don't remember for one of the labs in ec uh, yeah cn lab so i did network intrusion detection using ml techniques and uh, i had a very steep learning curve in that because i did not delve into ml uh, till then and i was uh, i but i i had a very good knowledge in data science and data analytics because that field really interests me even now so then i was willing to learn about ml and i had a lot of support from my uh, peers because it was a group of 3 and uh, the other two people really helped me getting on the same pace with them and hence i could contribute to the project and uh, it is a really nice project like it um, it detects whether your system is under attack or not so uh, initially that was our conception that uh, we could just detect if it's safe or it's not but then as we delved more into the project we saw that using different ml techniques not only could we detect if the system is in under attack or not we could also classify what type of attack our system is under so uh, that was one of the perks of going into because this is what we did not even expect to achieve but then we could find that the system could like it could classify our model could classify so uh, and i really enjoyed being part of this project because it gave me a lot of insight and i can't even begin to say how interested i am in this field and i would like to uh, further enhance my knowledge in this area which actually brought me on a really good term with data science data analytics and it helped me a lot basically the uh, second project which i did was in samsung prism it is a uh, mobile code networks video optimization so in that project uh, i had to uh, like uh, usually we use wifi for video streaming and stuff like that on our phone or laptops right so uh, but then when we use our uh, phones data the uh, video stream usually drops quality or we can, we can't experience uh, like good service but then uh, we have figured out uh, we have completely figured out like there was uh, there was a lot of things that i had to do it was a project in around 5 months 6 months so uh, like uh, we had to uh, create an aws server and stuff like that and uh, i'm not going to go into the details but basically uh, what we thought is if we could um, you know um, devote a particular amount of bandwidth to a particular amount of bitrate so that would really help the uh, service that our mobile network uh, service is providing so uh, using that we accomplished that uh, a lot of um, network resource savings and uh, we could also stream videos in much better quality so um, that in that project it, we were a group of four and uh, we also had a mentor from our college as well as a samsung uh, mentor so all of like everyone else helped a lot and everyone were really supporting everyone were contributing number one is none of us slacked off which is really important once you are in project because you have to make sure that you are not the only one doing the entire work everyone should be contributing then it it actually the um, mood in fact and your enthusiasm of contributing to the project goes up because you feel like okay we are talking and then the thing progresses and it gives you a lot of satisfaction once you accomplish something and trust me when you get through the project it is worth it mm -hmm. all the hard work everything is worth it so you should definitely try out projects it's and it gives a very good boost to your cv thank you guys your experience would really help us moving forward well yeah now moving on so talking about a few decisions or errors could you like tell us like all three of you all combined as to some of the errors or like some minor mistakes that you all made <clears throat> while applying for internships or jobs and is there any particular advice that you can give us like regarding what where to apply what to apply and how to go about it 
I think some you can start and maybe uh, continue. I'm not actually the best person to ask this question because uh, fortunately I got placed with the first company I applied to, so I can't really comment on this. Otherwise, uh, in general, I would say that start off with DSA as early as you can. That gives you a edge over other people. That's it. Abhirup and Prita, anything that you would like to add on? Uh. Well, yeah. Once again, as as I said, uh, my aim has always been higher studies. So for me, the internship part was only, you know, uh, first of all, yeah, as a college requirement. The other thing is just something to do for these six months. So for I think, but the thing is that was my mistake because uh, if I had put in a little bit more effort into like placement prep, because I remember all of my peers were, you know, really into okay, we have to practice coding, we have to do all of this. So I like they were actually even uh, learning about the placement process itself. Like even now, I don't really know how it works. So the thing is, I didn't really uh, pay that much attention to it or give that give it that much importance that it deserved. So I was just uh, choosing companies on a whim. Like okay, yeah, this sort of sounds like something I'd enjoy doing. So let's apply here. I would say even if you want to go for higher studies and the internship is just you know something to do. So given a bit more effort than that because this six months can uh, help you build skills that might be helpful as you are pursuing your masters. So yeah, if there also another advice I would give for that maybe don't don't try to rush your placement. Don't apply to every single company that comes along because even now there are really good companies that are still coming. So don't you know get into a panic that okay all of my friends are getting placed. I need. Whatever I'll just apply to any company that comes in now. Don't do that. You know, be be calm about it, and eventually you will probably get something that you'll be happy with. Thank you, Abhiru. Prita, is there anything you uh, like? Yeah. So I feel that um, even I like I think I gave I gave three to four OTs before I uh, order OT OT for Wells Fargo, and I did not clear any of those. And uh, but. Wells Fargo was the only one which I cleared, and then I did not expect, but I got through the interview. But uh, okay, uh, so what happened is actually, had I started DSA earlier, maybe I could have cleared the OTs of the pre for the previous companies, but then I did not, and I could only cover a little bit of DSA, and uh, that really helped me get an edge even in my Wells Fargo interview. And another important thing is, uh, which I wish that I had done. Is prepare company wise because each company has a different approach of recruiting. So uh, looking at past papers and uh, seeing the trend that the company is going forward, being in pace with the company that uh, like okay, so this tomorrow it's this company ka OT. So I have to know what this company is up to right now in case I clear the OT. If I say this in the interview, that might help you, uh, you know, get a positive give a positive effect like it helps a lot but then i did not do that but it becomes such a rush because all companies try to come at once and uh, there are multiple things where you have to apply and then you have to go to their website and then apply again that people often forget that you have to also uh, think from the company's perspective from the recruiter's perspective what they want an ideal candidate to be like so if i think that i if I think that uh, you can do that, then it will be great. And yeah, you can clear the OTs. You can clear the interviews no matter what. Even if you are not from computer branches or you're from any other branches, if you just show them that, yes, you are worth it, you are eligible and uh, you belong in that company, then there's nothing that can stop you from being in that company. Thank you, Prita. We'll definitely keep all this in mind. Moving ahead, uh, Kushagar, you can take it over from here. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, folks, for the penultimate question of this interview is actually a sponsored question. Um, we would like to know how I triply helped you in your professional as well as your college life. We already heard a little bit of this from Abhirup, so I would like to get an insight from uh, both of you guys. I triply sponsored question. Uh, yeah, so I can't just sum it up in one single. 30 second answer or one minute answer. Like what IEEE has helped me with, it has helped me with a lot of things. Being more open, being more uh, fluent with people, 
being a more personable person, managing more things, understanding how things work, a lot of those things, things being a professional in networking and like portraying yourself as a professional in the online world and among people who have more experience than you. But in my tenure as a chairperson for IEEE, I learned three very key things, you can say. The first is you need to take initiative and do everything by yourself. Second, you cannot do everything yourself. And uh, third thing is that uh, you can delegate authority to a different person, but you cannot delegate responsibility to another person. If you can tell the other person that you need this from them, but you cannot be answerable for their shortcomings. Like you have to take the brunt of the responsibility if you feel that, if the other person feels that task. So yeah, you have to take it initiative and do everything yourself. You can't do everything yourself. And you have to understand how responsibility and authority work in the real world. Um, I can't sum it up in uh, one statement or I can't sum it up. But then, uh, as I said, I joined IEEE as a management com committee member. And uh, when I joined IEEE, I was merely a college kid. I had no idea what's going on. I'm just like that. OK, IEEE is nice. IEEE is um, it's good. Like IEEE is really good. And I wanted to get into IEEE. I wanted from the first year itself. But then uh, I did not get through, so I tried again in the second year and then I got through. And um, but after coming to IEEE, I understood what the hype is all about because IEEE is really important. Before joining IEEE, I didn't know what taking up responsibility is like. But and I was scared. I was shy. I did not make networks all the time. I did not talk to a lot of people. I did not want to even discuss my ideas with other people or if people are in the same field. Like you usually try to discuss and you see what comes up. If you have similar interests, then that's a good talk. So I didn't know all of that. I didn't do any of that. So after joining IEEE, I uh, got to talking to people. I got to make a lot of nice networks and I'm sure they'll all help me throughout in my journey and like even if you don't see a, an immediate response, if you don't see, you may not able to find out what IEEE, what role IEEE is playing in your life, in your career. But then trust me, in the long run, you will find out. Because right now, when I see a responsibility which is allotted to me or some, some duty which is allotted to me, I'm not scared. I don't run away. Because I know that I have to take it on and I know how to deal with it. Even if some hurdles come along the way, I know how to deal with them and I know that I will get through because that's what IEEE has taught me. I know what to do when a problem comes and not just be scared. Anything you'd like to add, uh, do? Uh, yeah, I would say Preeta also touched upon this a bit. It's like uh, it, uh, yeah, as even when I joined IEEE, I was of the mindset that, okay, I'm in IEEE, I'm studying my subjects, I'm giving my exams, that's it. So what, when I joined IEEE, it helped me, it prevented me from having that myopic view of my academic journey. It helped me understand that what I'm doing is only just a part of what I'm supposed to be doing. So after joining IEEE and, uh, you know, I used to, Look, look at what IEEE Explorer and all of those pages. And I used to see what students in other countries and other colleges are doing. So that helped me uh, recognize what my academic journey should be like. So that helped me explore more on my own. And, you know, it helped me branch out from just, you know, being uh, tunnel, tunnel visioned on my, okay, I need to get my degree or whatever. And the other thing, obviously, I guess, I think this is the common trend and this is the same answer you'll get from any IEEE member. Is that it helps you become more open, you know. I think I was I was in the same class as uh, Preeta and Samik in the first year, but I'm pretty sure I didn't talk to the both of them like even once because I was a very closeted guy. Like I used to sit in the corner. I'll just do my studies uh, if I show up to class. That is, but like after second year, I've become a lot more open, uh, especially as electronics. I had to lead a lot, you know, guide a lot of students. So. Actually, that actually helped me uh, motivate me to study my subjects because I know next year these are guys are going to ask me about this thing. So 
so i you know just not just the only half of the motivation to study my subjects was not to be embarrassed next year so yeah i would say these were the benefits that i found after joining at play thank you that was indeed a very inspiring closet story and uh, i'm sure our seniors would love that love those answers yes anyhow folks we have reached uh, the final question so uh, all three of us would like to ask you so it's not a common thing that it's very common that we all make mistakes but if you could go back to the past yeah is there an, any one particular thing that you would like to change or is there any one particular moment that you would like to reflect back upon and be like i could have done that or i could have done this or something that i could have changed looking back in time hmm. i, I have, have no regrets yeah i would probably have joined uh, i triple in my first year you know just to start getting publicity publicity let's yeah. go <laughs> trust me uh, the publicity that you're doing uh, we have done it as well so i know i know what you want to hear but yeah but yeah just genuinely i would have joined i triple sooner if i could so that would have helped me you know make friends earlier you know get started on my electronics journey quicker as well well samik and prita anything if i could go back and just talk to myself i'll just tell myself to stop being so afraid of trying new things because it does not matter if you fail like what if you succeed and even if you fail just try the next thing what if you succeed at that like don't do that if you don't even try like don't be afraid of failing adding up to what samik said i think i have a similar problem but uh, i'm trying i'm trying but uh, yeah i also tend to stress out a lot i used to stress out even more but uh, yeah that is probably why i did not get through an i triple e the first year and i really wish i had but then i think i have to go back in time and tell myself that it's okay it's going to be okay and i have to keep a little more belief in myself that yes i can do it if i if i don't believe in myself how can i expect the other people who are talking to me to believe in myself so yeah i would probably do that well thank you thank you so much i'm pretty sure our seniors also would love the publicity that we have done well now passing the passing the stage on to kushagar you could end it sure uh, so i would first of all like to extend a heartfelt gratitude to our guests for their sea of knowledge as well as their ocean of patience and with that we have come to the end of this interview i'm happy if you enjoyed this video uh, press the like button click the subscribe button ring the bell for more i triple e goodness that we'll be bringing you in a short while Thank you so much for watching and thank you for being with us.